What I have the pleasure to now do is introduce Dan Brown. Dan um, is one of those unusual Australians. He's both modest and accomplished. And uh, he, he's um, very accomplished, and you wouldn't know it if you, if you just talked to him and asked him about what was happening. But his, one of his features is he's one of the key people behind the Land Plan Marino Genetic Services, basically the Australian SIL system, both in its design and its delivery. And he's an accomplished scientist who's worked in the development of some of those tools that are blended into that system. So the sort of final um, feather in his cap would be that he's a farmer himself and he can speak farmer language. So what better person than to explain what the Australians are doing in sheep genetics? Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That, um, you probably spoke way too highly of me, but I will do my best to um, live up to both those expectations anyway. I, I feel that I'm pretty um, equivalent to, um, to Mark. I've been involved in the delivery of breeding values to industry now in Australia for uh, about 15 years, um, and also the research and development. So I've, I've selected a few things that I think are topical in Australia that might be of interest um, to, to you guys here today. So I'm going to cover some background just to set the scene a bit of how um, our databases and our, our breeds look in Australia and what sort of traits we, we cover. I'll touch a bit on genomics and how we've um, set about incorporating genomics in our routine evaluation. I picked out a couple of things that we're working on in terms of R&D for new traits um, to talk about. And also I'd like to talk about both um, opportunities um, to do a better job of producing breeding values for people to use in our industry um, and also potential challenges and also opportunities for collaboration um, as well. So essentially, um, in a similar fashion, our sheep genetics genetic evaluation is about delivering you know, breeding values that are useful um, to the industry as a whole, and we're constantly evolving to make those tools more accurate and more relevant. Um, and um, QA is an important part right through that system, and we're constantly trying to, to make sure our breeding values are credible and reliable. And um, breeders are always, always thinking about new things and we're, we're looking at new traits or new ways to um, de define genetic merit more accurately for breeders, breeders to use. So just a snapshot of, of our main analyses and um, how many members we have and how that's changing over time. Essentially we have five key analyses. The, the first one is the smallest, is some meat goats and we've actually seen an increase in that in Australia in, in recent years. Um, our land plan has two analyses, uh, the terminal size, which has about uh, 450 fox um, registered now, um, and our maternals are about 110 um, active members. So they've uh, declined a little bit in recent time. Um, there's been some um, big flocks getting bigger, and there's also been a few um, dispersals and retirements that have... Um, that have, um, where the family hasn't wanted to conti continue the business. So we've seen a, a small reduction there. But in terms of the numbers of animals, we haven't seen much change. Um, our other two analyses are merino analyses, one for the, for the merinos and one for the Dooney merinos. So there's about 300 odd members um, actively recording in, the, in those two, two analyses. And in terms of the number of animals, we've got about, um, in those three main analyses, let's say two million animals um, recorded in those, in those databases, and I'll talk a bit more about the breakup of those animals. But um, we see per year um, about 125,000 new um, ra um, animals being assessed each year, um, and slightly less in, in the maternals, and about 120 merinos coming through each year. So we have a, a, a sniffing and influx there in those three breeds each, each year, and um, smaller, smaller numbers in our in our two, um, two bottom ones there. So just to give you a bit of a snapshot of the breed makeup of those analyses, uh, in, in the 2014 drop in the maternal analysis, you'll see a, a probably a slightly different um, breed composition than what you'd see here in New Zealand, but we um, have traditionally had um, Cooperworth and Border Leicesters being two of the, the, the key maternal breeds. We do exchange data with New Zealand, so we do have a, a snippet n a number, obviously, of New Zealand Coopworth and and Kyrale flocks. Well, we've got a growing, um, what we call here, commercial maternal. They're essentially composite breeders in that analysis. And I'll, I'll talk more about that um, as we as we go go on. And if we look at the the terminals, um, we see that 
most of our flocks are white suffolk and pole dorsets. We also have some New Zealand pole dorsets in there and, and some dorpers. But um, these graphs are based on flock, um, breed of the flock, which, which doesn't actually clearly represent breed composition. We're seeing now that while these call themselves white suffolk and pole dorset flocks, they're becoming less purebred. And if we look at this 2014 drop, we see that now um, I think it's over 50% of the animals are composite in some way and um, some, some animals have up to 15 breeds in them. So um, that's, the, that's the, way, the way the industry's evolving in all our, all our analyses and I'll, I'll talk more about that. It has a lot of implications for the, the way we produce breeding values. So I just want to touch really briefly on adoption. Um, in this first column I've got those three main analyses but uh, essentially we've got an estimate of how many rams are bought and sold with breeding values. So essentially what sort of traction we've got in the ram sale market and we believe it's about 70% in terminals and 45 in maternals, but still only 35 in merinos. So there's <coughs> lots and lots of opportunity for us to actually get better adoption on the ground, people using and these breeding values for their, for their RAM purchases. In terms of genetic progress, I haven't put any graphs in, but essentially um, we're about the $2 per year um, improvement in profit profitability in the, in the terminals. Um, somewhere similar, maybe a bit lower in, in maternals and even lower again in, in Merino. So um, I don't want to dwell on those numbers except to say on, on average we're making um, significant progress in those breed groups but there's tremendous variation between flocks within each of those analyses and I think there's lots of improvements um, to do better, to do a better job of that and I'll touch on some of those um, in a minute. I'd just like to talk a little bit more about um, that breed composition issue um, which are, is important in our analyses, um, the way we do things. So. Um, if we think about a merino analysis, what, historically we had three main strains, our fine and medium and strong wool strains, but what we see is, like the breed composition, we see more mixing of strains. So our, our flock is now much more made up of um, crosses between these, between these various strains which we need to accommodate in our analyses. In our maternals, we, we did have traditionally purebreds, but now we're seeing more composites um, and crossbreds coming into that analysis. And again, in the, in the terminals, we, we really are dominated by um, these original purebreds, but all sorts of breeds coming into the mix now. So it's changed, um, and we're much more a multi-breed um, analysis now in all those, in all those um, three cases. So when we look and think about what's happening in the commercial flocks, it's actually, um, we see five key production systems now um, being employed on farm. Um, there's the traditional merino flocks, which range from um, heavily wool-focused flocks through to you know, more dual-purpose flocks, which are much more involved in the land production um, industry. We see an increasing trend for um, self-replacing terminal flocks. So these are mostly composite or sometimes terminal breeds um, that um, essentially want to maintain a, a self-replacing type system. We also see a, um, a large number of flocks now crossing um, Merino use with um, terminal size, the increase in value in, in sheep sales has, has driven that from merino breeders joining a proportion of their, of their use to, to terminal size. Then we've got the traditional Australian system where we have a first cross ewe with maternal size joined a merino ewes and then crossed with a, with a terminal sire. So we, we sort of target all the out, outputs to try, and, to try and address those five key, key production systems. In terms of what traits are important in Australia, traditionally in the, in the merinos, you know, really focused on early growth and, and um, early wool traits, but more and more things like lifetime but, um, performance, adult traits, mature size, things like reproduction are, are becoming more and more important and more well recorded. Um, and also of recent times, carcass attributes, quality um, and disease resistance are becoming more, more important as well. Similar story in maternal breeds without the focus on on um, wool and um, terminal breeds have been really focused on early growth, but more and more lambing ease, carcass quality and disease resistance are coming into the mix there too as well. So um, that's essentially the background. I'd like to talk now a little bit more detail about, about our analysis and what sort of traits we actually produce breeding value, values for. Um, I won't go into the details, but essentially in our system we have um, a, a number of ages of recording from birth through to adult and carcass traits. But we essentially have um, eight or nine trait groups as I've defined them here, just to summarise it. Obviously weight, um, scan, carcass, fat and muscle, fleece weight and wool quality, the, the wool traits, are, um, there's a large number of those we, we analyse. 
Um, we can deliver breeding values for something like 100 traits, but um, not all breeders obviously use all 100 traits. So recently we've developed um, breeding values for, for meat quality, and I'll talk more that, about those shortly. We've got a range of reproduction traits, scrotal circumference, more and more visual traits um, being recorded by breeders, particularly in, in, the, in the merinos, um, and obviously um, worm resistance and worm egg count are, are an important um, part of that. So I've just got two slides to talk about our um, genetic engine, as, as you're used to hearing it, um, just to describe some of the key things that we try and accommodate in, in those analyses. Um, for the weight and fleece weight, we fit maternal effects. It's a, it's a, they have an important effect on, on performance, and we try and account for that as best we can. We've also, um, breeders are recording traits more and more, and we see more body weights in particular and, and adult performance traits. So we've got repeated records now um, for the weight traits as well as wool traits and reproduction, and now we're accommodating up to five records for those um, traits and a lot, lot, we're seeing a lot more breeders um, start to record those adult performance throughout life. Um, just a couple of key, key points about um, our analysis. Um, those maternal effects are um, both the heritable component and the environmental component of the dam um, are, are accounted for. As I, as I mentioned, our, our breed effects are very important in our analyses, both in, in um, the strain effects in the merino analysis and also those um, differences in the breeds in the, in the maternal and terminal analysis are important. So we fit genetic groups and that's a, been a, a, a big challenge for us to get right across those, those various analyses. We also have you know, a very diverse environment like, like, like here in New Zealand and um, we have very different levels of variation in um, the phenotypes collected and it's important for us to account for that um, variation um, in the performance across traits. We also have seen repeatedly that um, that um, side by flo flock year effects um, are apparent in our data. Sometimes um, sires don't perform equally in all the flocks and years that, years that been, they've been used, and we've shown that fitting these in our analysis produces more reliable breeding values. We're also, and also, um, we're obviously delivering um, genomically enhanced breeding values for a large number of traits now, and I'll, I'll talk more about that um, sh very sh shortly. Um, so just to summarise how, how we actually deal with genomics in our routine evaluations, essentially um, we deliver genomically enhanced breeding values for up to 32 traits now in our, in our merinos and less, less so in our maternal breeds. Um, those genomically enhanced breeding values are reported um, as, an, as, as our normal breeding values, so they're included in the indexes, indexes by default. We actually, we actually use two approaches at the moment. We use a, um, a blending approach for the, for the um, traits that have already got breeding values available, but we've also, through genomics and our reference population, developed um, some new traits for um, breeding values for seven carcass traits, and we actually do a single step analysis um, for those, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about shortly. So essentially the, the blending, um, similar approach is used here, I believe. Um, essentially, we're just using a weighted, weighted average of the, of the phenotypic breeding value and the, and the GEBV, and I'll talk more about how we actually do that. But I, I thought it's worth mentioning that um, at the moment, our approach is only to, be, to do that for animals that have phenotypes and, and their flock is in the system, um, because essentially we're blending um, within flock breeding values and we're relying on the, on the phenotypic ASBV to take care of the breed and, and flock effects. Um, which is an important part at the moment. If an animal doesn't, if an animal is genotyped and not in the evaluation already, we don't um, we don't produce breeding values for them. Obviously, um, without our CRC reference flock, or we call it the um, CRC information nucleus flock, um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do with genomics. That's essentially a large population of animals phenotyped at eight different sites across Australia. Um, they're extensively phenotyped for the standard traits as well as the hard to measure traits like eating quality, for example, um, and also genotypes. So we use that, um, that database to underpin our, our work in genomics. <coughs> so just to touch on how we actually use that, essentially we have this reference population where we've got phenotypes and genotypes and we produce a genomic breeding value. Then we, we go through a process of validating that. We, can, we estimate um, GBVs for a, a a number of validation sizes, as we call them. So these are animals that are extensively phenotyped and have lots of progeny records, and we compare that to the GBV to work out how accurate um, our genomic prediction can be. And then we can, we can use that reference population, genotypes some selection candidates and produce the GBV, 
um, based on the genotype, then we essentially blend it with the standard um, breeding value from our phenotypes and produce our enhanced breeding value, which becomes our, our standard um, reported Australian sheep breeding value, as we call it. So that underpins that, that, that blending, blending process. Just to give you a feel of what sort of accuracies we're, we're seeing, um, essentially for, for wool traits, we see generally higher accuracies, um, up to about 0.5 for, for some of the wool traits, and we've been able to show that even for late, late age um, adult wool traits, we've been able to predict them quite well. For the carcass traits and body weight traits, um, again, quite, quite significant um, accuracies, about the 0.3 to 0.5 um, is what we're using in our evaluation. We do see in merinos and terminals some um, moderate accuracies for worm egg count. Um, carcass traits at this stage uh, in this uh, is probably a bit lower. They're probably a bit higher now we've got more data. Um, at today, we haven't actually delivered any breeding values for reproduction traits. Um, we've done some preliminary analysis for reproduction, but um, and they look encouraging, but we need to um, do a better job of, of reproduction and before we actually do that routinely in our analyses. These are essentially conservative, um, we believe. These accuracies are designed to be within flock accuracies. We can actually predict things better across, um, across the strains in merinos, but um, we actually um, have taken a conservative approach with these accuracies um, to start with. We also, also note that so far we haven't been able to predict a, a crossbreed with our um, 50,000 SNPs that we're, we're routine, routinely using, and we're only actually delivering these enhanced breeding values to for all our major breeds at the moment in Australia. And we'd like to be able to service more breeds, but um, we're not at the position we can do that accurately at this point in time. So I just want to touch briefly on our single step analysis that I referred to. Essentially, in this analysis, we combine all our phenotypes and our genotypes um, into one analysis. Um, and rather than going down that blending approach. And we've, do, we've done this so far for those seven meat traits, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more detail about that in a minute. Essentially, um, putting everything in, in one analysis has, a, has a, a couple of key benefits. It enables us to essentially increase the size of our, our reference population because we're including all animals that are, that are phenotyped. So, for example, for a trait like body weight, we include all the reference um, population plus all animals um, in industry flocks that, are, that have those body weights and have been genotyped. It also gives us the ability to extend the, the genotypic information um, through to some of the unpedigreed animals, um, sorry, ungenotyped animals. And um, it also lines up the ASPVs or the phenotype um, breeding values with the genomics, which is one of our challenges with blending, especially in those multi-breed populations. It's been a, a bit of a technical challenge for us to make sure that we're not um, double counting some of those breed effects, for, for, for example. So um, some time ago, we tried to quantify what sort of benefits and accuracies we see. These are those seven um, carcass traits that I referred to. Essentially, sorry, essentially um, using a normal pedigree system and phenotypes, we might um, see an accuracy uh, um, about 0.25 to 0.3. Um, at the time, our, our accuracies through those validation size, we're sitting um, about the 0.2 to 25, but when we look at the accuracies from our single step analysis, it, it's getting closer to 0.4. So that's just the, the sort of principles that we're seeing. We're seeing a benefit from combining those sources into, into, um, into one analysis. So um, going from, that, from those seven, trait, um, seven carcass traits to a fully single step analysis in all our routine evaluations is a bit of a hurdle, and we've been working on that for a, for a while. There's a lot of extra computational demands from running two million animals with, um, with those, all those genotypes as well. So we're work actively working on that. And one of our biggest challenges that we're working on is dealing with these um, information from multiple bleeds and composites. Um, when you have genotypes, you actually get um, information about those um, relationships across breed, which we need to make sure that we're accounting for properly in our routine evaluations. Um, and we also want to be able to accommodate animals that don't have any phenotypes or haven't been in the system as well. So we need to make sure that um, by using the genomic information, we actually can genetically group those animals to get their um, appropriate breed differences coming out in their breeding values. And that's something we're working on at the moment as well. We also want to do more cross-validation and, and in quantifying the benefits of, of d going down this single step approach and making sure we're producing breeding values that are, are good predictions of genetic merit for, for breeders, breeders to use. So I just want to change tack a bit slightly now to cover some 
um, this is not necessarily new traits, but some work we've been doing about um, the various traits that are important right now to industry that we're not um, perhaps analysing as well or, or we're not producing breeding values for. I'm, I'm going to talk about those four, first four. We've done recently done a lot of work um, looking at younger age fleece measurements, which I, in the interest of time I won't, I won't talk about today. So the first one there was reproduction traits. We've done a lot of work um, trying to produce more reliable breeding values for reproduction. It's something that's been um, an ongoing process, but um, we're just right now trying to develop what we call an enhanced reproduction analysis where we, we do a better job of that. And the key aspects of that will be, firstly, getting better data, data from breeders. Traditionally in Australia, we didn't get good joining information. For example, when the rams went in, when the rams come out, um, who were in the multiple sire groups, and things like that that we want to um, have on hand so we can do a better job of producing the best breeding values. And we also want to break our analysis up so we um, deal with um, the components of reproduction better. Currently, we just analyse net reproduction rate, which is essentially, in our definition, number of lambs weaned per ewe joined. But in fact, that's a, um, a function of three um, key traits, fertility, litter size, and lamb survival. And we want to actually break that up for two main reasons. Um, to give breeders the ability to, breed, um, to record bits of that. For example, some breeders won't have lamb survival, but they might have fertility and litter size information, so we can make use of that data better. It'll also allow us to model each trait better. Um, the model for fertility might be different to the model of survival um, in our analysis, so it gives us a better ability to tailor our analysis for each component. We also want to include some correlated traits. We know in Australian data that maternal birth score or um, maternal ability um, of the ewe has an influence on some of those traits, so particularly survival, and we want to take account of that um, where it's being recorded. We've also been able to show that pregnancy scanning information, it's um, more and more popular in Australia now, and we can use that to get good indications of fertility and litter size. So we want to make use of that data for flocks that don't mother up in the paddock, for example, at lambing time. We also want to include the work we've done on genomics and, and have a single step analysis so we can um, produce more accurate breeding values for those animals that have been genotyped, especially at a, at a younger age. We also want to look at some other traits that might have um, correlations with reproduction, and I'll talk more about fatness, but there's other traits in merinos, like wrinkle, for example, is quite correlated with reproduction, so if essentially we want, to, we want to include that in the mix as well to produce more accurate breeding values um, for our animals across the board. The other, the other thing I want to touch on briefly is life, lifetime performance. It's had a, um, uh, of late, there's been a lot more interest, particularly in merino breeders, but across the board in lifetime productivity. We generally measure animals at a young age in Australia and we don't have enough um, adult measurements. Um, we're trying to change that and we're trying to make better use of adult records in analysis full stop. And to do that, we've, we've essentially undertaken a range of research across merinos and also our terminal and maternals on a range of traits. We've looked at adult weights, um, as well as weight changes from particular time points of the year. We've looked at fleece weights, U condition scores um, from a range of data sets, and I'll touch on some of the results um, very briefly in a minute. Um, and I, we've looked at the correlation across ages and acro also across different time points within the year. Um, and it's my feeling, this is a personal opinion, and I think that people um, are not recording enough adult records. We've been able to show that there's a lot of value in recording adult performance, and I think. Um, I've been encouraging breeders to, to think about recording that more, um, both from a lifetime productivity point of view, but also mature white, um, size and bending the growth curve. I know others will um, talk more on this, but I think that's uh, something we really need to be focusing more on um, in Australia particularly. Um, and we've gone about using more, more of these records in our routine evaluations where pre breeders are, are recording them. And with EIND and electronic recording becoming um, a lot easier, um, we want to use those records if breeders are, are actually collecting them. So this is just an example. Um, I've pulled out fleece weight here as an example of some of the analysis we've done. We've done this for merinos and our maternal and terminal breeders, and essentially the same message holds true for, for um, other traits as well. But essentially what we see is that our yielding um, or our young age measurements are good predictors of adult performance, but these correlations are not one. You know, significantly different to one, so that suggests that there's extra value in recording um, some adult measurements. We see hogget recording, so 18 months um, old animals generally are more highly correlated with adult performance, but still not one. But once you get out to two-year-old and beyond, the correlations are very high and not significantly different to one. 
So essentially our recommendation to breeders is, um, you know, if you're recording at yearling, try and get another um, adult record at some, some one of these ages on a, on a good, group, good group of animals to, tr to try and separate those um, adult performance traits out from and this essentially applies, we've done this for a range of wool traits in merinos, we've also done it for the body weight traits in, in all our breeds, we've also done it for um, ewe condition score um, in a range of breeds and I think the same conclusion, they're not always exactly the same, but the same general conclusions can be made from all those analyses that we've done. Another um, hot topic in Australia is ewe condition score and or fatness of the ewe and how important that is and I think that's come about from two main reasons. The first is, you know, the increase interest in meat and slaughter animal value. It's become more and more important in all, our, in all our breeds. But also, there's been an extension campaign in Australia through um, lifetime wool and what we call bread well, fed well, to get commercial breeders more thinking about um, ewe condition and making sure they use meat condition score targets. So that's a management or a phenotypic um, type message, but people have got that confused with genetics. And so we've done a fair bit of work to try and disentangle those two. Obviously, you know, um, you need to manage use so that it put, they get their best reproduction, but um, that doesn't always apply to the genetic relationships and what you should measure in your breeding program. So I'd like to just touch on that issue just, just briefly. So um, we've done a, a range of a, a analyses on U condition score, mostly from uh, that research um, INF population that I, that I mentioned, which was most, mostly merino, merino U's, but not always. And essentially what we found is that ewe condition score is highly correlated um, across different time points within a year, um, even with or without adjustment for, for reproduction events. It's also highly correlated um, with young animal fatness. So our ultrasound scanning on young animals is highly correlated to ewe condition score. Genetic, this is genetically correlated, I should say. Um, so that's obviously got important implications. If we're going to change ewe fatness, we're going to change the fatness of our slaughter animals. Unless we, unless we manage that. So um, I think that um, it, we need to do more work thinking about the implications of, of fatness. Um, and on, it's the last point on that slide is that I think that um, we need to value it through the whole production change and make sure we're accounting for that properly um, in our breeding objectives. And we've also been able to show pretty clearly that why fat, um, ewe fatness is correlated with reproduction performance, both phenotypically and genetically, the correlations are not very high genetically. So if you're interested in reproduction, um, I would suggest measure reproduction, not rely on fatness. We've also done a, a range of analyses trying to work out um, whether condition score of the ewe um, is more important in tough years or um, versus good years, and I'll talk a little bit more about that now. So just um, a, a brief summary of some of, the, some of the work we've done to try and illustrate the value of recording reproduction versus the value of recording um, fat and muscle. I've just got an example here where we've got four scenarios using a merino example and a dual purpose index where we're measuring a set of standard traits as we've called them, base traits. Then we add on recording reproduction, fat and muscle or both together. And essentially the, the message is that um, if we record reproduction we get a, a sniffier jump um, in the progress for reproduction traits. This is just summarising the gains in reproduction over 10 years. We can see that Measuring the base trait, we predict about a 2% gain over 10 years. If we measure reproduction, we bring that up to about 5%. If we were to measure fat and muscle based on the correlations between the traits that we know, we only see a, see a small jump in um, reproduction. So if you're interested in reproduction, um, measure reproduction um, is, is my take home message. I'll probably say that again in a minute, sorry. But uh, as I said, we've also looked at a range of analyses to try and um, look at how well ASBVs, Australian Sheep Breeding Values, predict, predict daughter performance. We've done this in our research um, databases as well as our industry merino and, and maternal databases. And we've tried to understand the impact of seasonal conditions. So we've gone and got the rainfall and temperature, and in some cases condition score adjoining information from those data sets and tried to line them up with how, how big of impact the, the fat breeding values, uh, values had. So. What we've done here, we've, we've got some breeding values, and then we've looked at their, in this case, daughter performance in each of those, um, sorry, those sire breeding values, and then we've looked at their daughter performance in, in a number of databases. The first thing we did is we took their reproduction breeding values and lined them up with their daughter reproduction performance. Our expectation here is 0.5 because a sire only um, passes on half the genes to 
to his daughter, daughters. So a value of 0.6 is pretty good. We're pretty happy with that, given the complications of this data set. But when we took their fat and muscle breeding values, in this case I've just highlighted their fat breeding values and looked at both their fertility and their number of lambs um, born per year join performance, in the information nucleus across those eight sites, we didn't see any consistent significant effect. When we looked at the Merino database, we seen a small um, 0.1 and 0.01 and 0.01, uh, sorry, six improvement in fertility and a small improvement you know, on average in number of lambs born. So we're seeing that that correlation that I talked about is having an effect, but these are only very small effects compared to if you're actually looking at the trait um, itself. And we've seen no effect in the maternal um, database. So essentially, fat's having a small effect on average, but in reality, when we look at that effect, I've taken that um, relationship now and I've looked at the at um, how that varies across different flocks in our, in our analysis, how it varies across different flocks and years, um, and essentially what we see is that the effect is small on average and positive, but highly variable across different years and different seasons. So that's an important um, message as well. So essentially my key message is, um, in this area is that if you're interested in, in reproduction, measure the it trade itself. There is some, there is some um, small positive effects of having um, more muscle and fat in the ewes, but um, there's no evidence that it's actually bet more important in tough years in the data we've got. I think there's opportunity to get better data um, on environmental conditions. Something we were missing is, for example, information about supplementation and grazing um, methods. We don't, you really need more information if you're going to try and untangle these relationships um, and look at how they interact with, with, with seasonal conditions. And so, again, um, I think it's important, our message is that you record the traits that are important to you in the environments in which you expect the, the progeny to um, perform. Oops. Sorry. So, um, I'd like now to, to move on and talk about some opportunities to do, to do um, a better job, essentially, of producing breeding values. Um, I think there's, uh, there's a range of things that we can do um, to, to, to get better adoption rates and genetic gain in industry. I think it's pretty clear in Australia, at least, um, that both there's opportunities to in, in, improve adoption of um, the use of breeding values, both in ram breeders and, and commercial ram buyers. Um, I think there's huge variation between flocks and how well they use breeding values and, and actually incorporate them in the breeding program. I think for every trait that we produce breeding values, there's opportunity for us to, to produce more accurate breeding values um, based on how we analyse it in our, in our genetic engine, both in terms of the model and the trait definition. And for example, in Australia, of recent times, we've seen that for worm egg count, um, we see um, the genetic correlation between sites are not as, um, or between flocks or parts of the country are not as high as we'd like. And it seems to be that th there is a little GBOE in Australia um, where some rams don't perform uh, um, the same in every environment in which they're expressed. And part of that is um, differences in worm species that they're faced with, but I think that there's an opportunity there for us to do a better job of producing um, breeding values for worm, worm resistance, for example. I've already touched on um, repeat measurements. I think we need to measure more adults and get better handle on adult performance, particularly mature size. And I, thought, I think it's also important um, to try and get um, measurements um, of our key animals across a range of environments. Um, some, of our, some of our key size don't get, don't get used um, ac across the country or across different um, production systems as, as well as they could be. But I'd like to spend a little bit more time on data quality. I think this is where the biggest opportunity lies for us in the short term in Australia. As I said, there's huge variation um, across our breeds and our data sets in, in data quality. And I, I think there's opportunity for us to, to work more with breeders um, to get better, to better data and get better breeding values. So essentially, I've tried to summarise our, our essentially data collection pipeline. Essentially, you know, we have data collected in various forms um, on-farm, generally put into an on-farm software which has some data validation which may or may not be used. It's then exp exported to Sheep Genetics, um, turned into breeding values and imported back into that software and used in various reports by the breeder on-farm. I think, you know, this is a very simplified diagram but each step um, there's, 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 there's attempts to control data quality and do data validation to get the most accurate breeding values. But I think 
Um, we need to do a better job of providing timely feedback about um, potential errors um, and, and the quality of the, of the data. I'll just touch a bit more about some of those aspects of data quality that I'd, I wanted to talk about. We see in Australian data, and particularly in Merinos, big variation in the, in the amount of pedigree recorded um, and also the accuracy and the methods used to, to collect that pedigree. We see people using um, lambing rounds, mothering up in the paddock. We see DNA parentage being used. Some people are using EID systems. Um, and some people are mothering up at marking and, and they all have different implications for the quality of that pedigree and we do see some challenges there. Um, management grouping is our number one challenge. Getting the management groups right um, on farm and in the software is, is an ongoing challenge. We also see genetic linkage between, <coughs> pardon me, between years um, and also between sub, um, subgroups within a flock within a year. Um, that sometimes is not managed very well. And we also see a large variation in the effectiveness of the data. Um, the group sizes can be a big issue for us and the number of size represented is also something that we're, we're constantly keeping an eye on. And essentially, at the end of the day, this is all in the breeders' hands, um, but we, we're trying to play a more active role in working with the breeders to one, identify these and provide more timely feedback about any of these issues. And also, we're trying to proactively look at the data and analysis and to detect problems before um, breeding values um, are compromised so we can actually get in front of the problem rather than dealing with it when people are complaining about changes in breeding values. So um, we're trying to actually be a bit proactive across the board there with these, with these things. So I just briefly want to touch on collaboration. Um, I think um, Graham's already done a good job of highlighting the, the great team that you've got here in New Zealand. I think we've got a um, pretty good team in Australia too, but resources are tight and I think um, um, capacity is declining in Australia at least anyway in, in um, genetics research so I think there's lots of opportunities for us to, to, to work together. I thought I'd also mention that there already is some, some significant collaboration which is, which is great and I think the exchange of data um, that, that, that happens between, between us is, is, is a great step forward and I think that a lot of our breeders that are importing genetics or selling genetics are, um, really value that, that exchange of data. It currently happens for Coopworths, Chirales and Pole Dorsets, and essentially we exchange data, but we do separate analyses. We use the data and, and, and you use the data. I think that um, we can do more there. I, I just also noted that we essentially already have a trans-Tasman um, analysis in the marinos, and we're also doing some um, joint R&D, which I think, um, from my experience, I think it's been a, it's been a, a good process, process to step through. Um, I, th I think, you know, generally our production systems are are quite similar. We're facing common challenges. I think we should try and try and work more directly um, together. I'd like to see um, joint development of a, of a joint analysis in some way. Um, I think generally, we, we've looked at this a few times before, there are some differences um, which could be overcome with the right motivation. And I think there's lots of benefits um, um, for breeders, um, both ram breeders and commercial breeders, I, I think. Um, and I think it offers some... Um, some benefits from more efficient R&D and, 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 um, and would, I think, have some desirable um, outcomes for producing better breeding values across the, bo across the board. We've done a bit of work um, working with the Americans and going down this path, and I found it quite a uh, fruitful uh, experience um, producing breeding values and working with our international colleagues to, to produce the best breeding values possible. I just want to finish up just covering a couple of the key challenges that I think we face um, in Australia at, at, at the moment, um, and I am going to touch, touch on a couple, but I think genomic prediction offers a huge potential, but I think it's not being used as well as it could be um, by the Australian ram breeders, and we need to work together to make, make the system work better for them. A couple of the key challenges that we face at the technical level is that um, we don't currently produce um, breeding values for reproduction, which are obviously very important for maternal and merinos. Um, and I think we need to really make sure that we um, deliver that in, in, in the short term. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face is that because of the multi-breed nature of our data sets that I've tried to explain, um, we can choose to either predict across breed breeding values or essentially within breed breeding values. And that also applies at the flock um, level as well. And that brings with it some challenges at a technical level, but um, I think we also need to be clear about what we're trying to do because I see in the Merino example, we, we can produce um, a crossbreed um, genomic breeding values quite well, um, but we actually 
um, from a breeder's perspective, generally what they want to actually want to use on farm is more within uh, within flock breeding values. So that's a bit of a challenge that we're trying to we're trying to manage at the moment. Another issue we see, and I'll talk more about it, is genomic linkage to reference population, and I've got an example about that. Um, so what we see in, in the Australian data is that this is this is a um, the average relationship of some flocks that have got genotypes um, with our with our reference population and the impact on <coughs> essentially the accuracy of the genomic breeding value. And because of the way we do an analysis, this is what we expect. But as you get more related to the to the reference population, you get more accurate breeding values. So that's generally okay for the majority of flocks, but there are some flocks that are quite lowly related to the reference population. So that's important for us to, to find ways to um, work with those flocks, identify them, and also um, work with their variation within the flock. This is an example of that one red dot. While it's on average is quite um, well related to the reference, there are animals that actually aren't as well um, linked. And our breeding values take that into account, but um, more and more when we go into flocks that we don't know much about, they'll have variation in this in the relationship to the reference population and they'll need to know that that's going to influence, influence the accuracy of their genomic breeding value but they um, and we need to we need to be upfront about that and make sure that breeders have got the tools to, to manage that 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 issue and, uh, and aware of that issue so um, this is just an example um, I've probably already said this but it's the same way this is two populations of, of animals and essentially you can think of these as two flocks, again the relationship with the reference. We see this blue flock has much um, greater proportion of animals that aren't as well linked to the reference population and won't have as good as breeding values as this other <coughs> flock that has more um, relationship to that reference population. So it's in, if people want to use genomics they need to make sure that they've got um, sufficient linkage to that reference population that we're currently, we're currently using. Another issue that we're, we're constantly faced is with the electronic um, recording and EID, it's becoming easier to measure animals and we're seeing more and more um, observations being, being collected on farm. But because of that data delivery pipeline that we were talking about before, it is a bit of a challenge to get all that data in the right form into the sheep genetics analysis. Um, we've got a range of projects in Australia looking at this and I know the same thing's happening here, but we need to streamline this interaction between on-farm and sheep genetics to try and make that easier for breeders to do performance recording on farm. So we're actively working on that and trying to trying to do do a better job of that. Um, and I think basically my final slide, I just want to touch on um, mature size bit or body weight and feed costs. It's something that's um, been an issue for us in, in Australia we're trying to deal with and I think that um, it's, um, Tim and Mark will probably, probably cover this in, in much better detail. I just want to touch on the fact that it's important in Australia. Uh, I think essentially the value um, so the value of feed and how you deal with things like mature size is dependent on the production system. <coughs> Obviously, you know, the type of breed, the age at turn off, um, and particularly stocking rate, whether you're fully stocked um, or whether you're understocked, whether um, your desire to feed, the ability to feed and the cost of supplementary feed impacts these things. I don't think we deal with this as well as we could in Australia. Essentially, we, we produce breeding values for an average production system. But in reality, that only works for the average people. And I think um, we need to be more transparent about our assumptions of all these things. And um, I think, I don't really want to say it, but um, we probably need more indexes and a much clearer de definition of what our index assumption is because um, in particular, mature size and feed costs is, is, a, is an obvious one. And um, I think the same applies to when we start thinking about creating um, breeding values for U condition score and actually put an economic value on it. It's unfortunately it's not simple, and um, the variety of production systems we face makes this a bigger issue for you, for us. And um, I won't. I can talk about that for a fair while, but I'll leave it up to others. But um, so, in conclusion, um, essentially, I think you know, we, sheep genetics has done a lot of work to evolve um, with the changing industry, and. Um, and that's, that's both from a technical, um, the way we do our analysis and also the way we deliver breeding values. But essentially we're, we're seeing on the ground some positive outcomes in, in welfare, obviously reduced costs and increased production, which is, um, I think we're seeing uh, adoption rates of breeding values increase and will only continue to do so as um, with the cost price squeezing um, constantly um, facing us. So I think there's still lots of opportunities for us. Um, and I also think there's lots of opportunities for us to work more collaboratively um, between countries to solve some of the issues that we face in common.
Yep, I'll leave it there. Thank you. <clears throat>